One thing we uh, didn't fully finish talking about is open source. So first of all, congrats. You released a new model. Yeah. This is the, Tulu. <laughs> I'll explain what a Tulu is. A Tulu yeah. is a hybrid camel when you breed a dromedary with a back. Bakrian camel. Back in the early days after ChatGPT, there was a big wave of models coming out like alpaca, vicuna, et cetera, that were all named after various mammalian species. So Tulu, is the brand is multiple years old, which comes from that. Mm -hmm. And we've been playing at the frontiers of post-training with open source code. And this first part of this release was in the fall where we use, we've built on Llama's open models, open weight models, and then we add in our fully open code or fully open data. There's a popular benchmark that is Chatbot Arena, and that's generally the metric by which how these chat models are evaluated, and it's humans compare random models from different organizations. And if you looked at the leaderboard in November or December, among the top 60 models from tens to twenties of organizations, none of them had open code or data for just post-training. Among that, even fewer or none have pre-training data and code available, but it's like post-training is much more accessible at this time. It's still pretty cheap and you can do it. And the thing is like, how high can we push this number where people have access to all the code and data? So that's kind of the motivation of the project. We draw on lessons from Llama. NVIDIA had a Nematron model where the recipe for their post-training was fairly open with some data and a paper. And it's putting all these together to try to create a recipe that people can fine-tune models like GPT-4 to their domain. So, so to be clear, in the case of Tulu, maybe you can talk about Almo too, but in the case of Tulu, you're taking Llama 3405B. Tulu has been a series of recipes for post-training. So we've done okay. multiple models over years. Okay. And so you're open sourcing everything. Yeah, if you start with an open weight based model, the like whole model technically mm -hmm. is an open source because you don't know what Llama put into it which is why we have the separate thing that we'll get to, but it's just getting parts of the pipeline where people can zoom in and customize. I know I hear from startups and businesses that are like, okay, like I can take this post-training and try to apply it to my domain. We talk about verifiers a lot. We use this idea, which is reinforcement learning with verifiable domain rewards, RLVR, kind of similar to RLHF. And we applied it to math. And the model today, which is like, we applied it to the Llama 405B base model, from last year and we have our other stuff we have our instruction tuning and our preference tuning but the math thing is interesting which is like it's easier to improve this math benchmark there's a benchmark m-a-t-h math all capitals tough name when the benchmark is name is the area that you're evaluating we're researchers we're not we're not brand brand strategists and this is something that the deep seek paper talked about as well is like at this bigger model it's easier to elicit powerful capabilities with this rl training and then they distill it down from that big model to the small model and this model we released today we saw the same thing is it, we're at ai2 we don't have a ton of compute we can't train 405b models all the time so we just did a few runs and they tend to work and it's like it just shows that there's a lot of room for people to play in these things and that and they crushed llama's actual release right like the, the they're way better than it yeah so our eval numbers i mean we have extra months in this but our eval numbers are like much better than the llama instruct mm -hmm. model that they released and then you also said better than deep seek v3 yeah on our eval benchmark the most deep seek v3 is really similar we have a safety benchmark to understand if it will say harmful things and things like that and that's what draws down most of the way it's still like, it's like an amalgamation of multiple benchmarks or what do you mean yeah so we have a 10 value this is like this is standard practice in post training is you choose your evaluations you care about in academics and smaller labs you'll have fewer evaluations in companies you'll have a really one domain that you really care about in frontier labs you'll have tens to twenties to maybe even like a hundred evaluations of specific things mm -hmm. so we choose a representative representative suite of things that look like chat, precise instruction following, which is like respond only in emojis. Like does the model follow weird things like that? Yeah. Math, code, and you create a suite like this. So safety would be one of 10 in that type of suite where you have like, what does the broader community of AI care about? And for example, in comparison to DeepSeek, it would be something like our average eval for our model would be um, 80, including safety and similar without, and DeepSeek would be like 79. Um, percent average score without safety and their safety score would bring it down to like oh so you, you beat them even ignoring safety yeah so this is something that internally it's like i don't want to win only by like how you shape the eval benchmark so if there's something that's like people may or may not care about safety in their model safety can come downstream safety can be when you host the model for an api like safety is 
addressed in a spectrum of locations in AI applications. So it's like, if you want to say that you have the best recipe, you can't just gate it on these things that some people mo might not want. Mm -hmm. And and this is just, it's like the time of progress. We benefit, we can release a model later. We have more time to learn new techniques like this RL technique. We had started this in the fall. It's now really popular with reasoning models. The next thing to do for open source post-training is to scale up verifiers, to scale up data, to replicate some of DeepSeek's results. And it's awesome that we have a paper to draw on and it makes it a lot easier. And that's the type of things that is going on among academic and closed frontier research in AI. Since you're pushing open source, what do you think is the future of it? You think DeepSeek actually changes things since it's open source or open weight or is pushing the open source movement into the open direction? This goes very back to the license discussion. So DeepSeek R1 with a friendly license is a major reset. So it's like the first time that we've had a really clear frontier model that is open weights and with a commercially friendly license with no restrictions on downstream use cases, synthetic data, distillation, whatever. This has never been the case at all in the history of AI in the last few years since ChatGPT. There have been models that are off the frontier or models with weird licenses that you can't really use them. So is, is, isn't Meta's law, my license like pretty much permissible except for five companies? Um, and there's also, so this goes to like what open source AI is, which is there's also use case restrictions in the Llama license, which says you can't use it for specific things. So if you come from an open source software background, you would say that that is not an open source license. What, what, are, what kind of things are those though? Like, are they like, it's, I, at this point, I can't pull them off like the top of my head, but it'll be like, competitor it used probably. to be military use was one oh, and they sorry. removed that for scale. It'll be like like CSAM, like child abuse material, or like that's the type of thing that is forbidden there, but that's enough from an open source background to say it's not an open source license. And also the Llama license has this horrible thing where you have to name your model Llama if you touch it uh -huh. to the Llama model. So it's like the branding thing. So if a company uses Llama, technically the license says that they should say built with Llama at the bottom of their application. And from like a marketing perspective, that just that just hurts. Like I can I could suck it up as a researcher. I'm like, oh, it's fine. Like it says Llama dash on all of our on all of our materials for this release. But this is why we need truly open models, which is uh, we don't know DeepSeek R1's data. But Ooh, wait, so you're saying I can't make a you know cheap copy of Llama and pretend it's mine, but I can do this with the Chinese model. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. And, yeah. and that's why it's like we want to, this whole open language models thing, the Olmo thing, is to try to keep the model where everything is open with the data as close to the frontier as possible. So we're compute constrained, we're personnel constrained, we're, we we rely on getting insights from people like John Schulman tells us to do RL on outputs. Like we can make these big jumps, but it just takes a long time to push the frontier of open source. And fundamentally, I would say that that's because open source AI does not have the same feedback loops as open source software. We talked about open source software for security. Also, it's just because you build something once and you can reuse it. If you go into a new company, there's so many benefits. But if you open source a language model, you have you have this data sitting around, you have this training code. It's not like that easy for someone to come and build on and improve because you need to spend a lot on compute. You need to have expertise. So until there are feedback loops of open source AI, it seems like mostly an ideolo ideological mission. Like people like Mark Zuckerberg, which is like, America needs this. And I agree with him, but in the time where the motivation ideologically is high, we need to capitalize and build this ecosystem around what benefits do you get from seeing the language model data? And there's not a lot about that. Uh, we're going to try to launch a demo soon where you can look at an Olmo model and a query and see what pre-training data is similar to it, which is like legally risky and complicated, but it's like, what does it mean to see the data that the AI was trained on? It's hard to parse. It's terabytes of files. It's like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to find in there. But that's what that's what we need to do as an ecosystem if people want open source AI to be financially useful. 